Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. We are going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time because we have a lot of information to share with you this evening. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us tonight. A lot of people have put a lot of time and invested a lot of energy into this evening's meeting, both our staff as well as parents, and we appreciate that. So we're gonna do everything we can to honor your time and get everybody out of here at a very reasonable hour because we know that you have families to get home to this evening as well. So I'm Jeff Arnett, I'm the superintendent, and it's my pleasure to be opening the meeting tonight. I'll join you later in the conversation as well. On your way in this evening, uh, you may have seen that there were cards with a QR code. Uh, we're going to try to organize the questions this evening because we know that there will be many, and we know that many of you probably have questions that align with very specific themes related to tonight's presentation. I'll share just a little bit more about that in a moment, but first, those of you who have had the opportunity to join me for any of the campus conversations that we've had at each of the elementary schools, the middle schools, and the high school over the last few weeks, you saw this slide. And this slide talks about our administrative priorities coming into the school year. All three of these pertain to the information that we're going to share with you tonight. What we're talking about with regard to Spanish immersion and doing our best to preserve the program as well as honoring other programs, all touch these three priorities, recruiting and retaining our staff, making sure that we're doing everything we can to make this the best school district for all of our community, all of your families, all of our students, as well as honoring the leaders of our school district as well, those who lead at the campus level every day because we want them to be their best. As you've heard me say many times, when our principals and our campus leaders get better, then our schools get better, and that's ultimately what we want. The reason why I share that, and the reason why they're here with us tonight, and you'll meet each of them individually in just a moment, is because there is a misperception perhaps related to the presentation that was given in October that a three-person committee came up with the recommendations regarding adjustments to the Spanish Immersion Program. I want you to know that that is not correct. As a matter of fact, there were many of us, myself included, an entire administrative and team, including our four elementary campus principals where Spanish Immersion is offered on their, on their campuses, all supported the recommended adjustments that have been discussed this fall. This was not a three-person committee. This was a very large administrative investment in trying to find ways to make our programs better for all students. So I want you to understand and appreciate why the principals are with us this evening, because they are speaking on behalf of their staff, speaking on behalf of your campuses, to talk about the challenges that we're facing with Spanish immersion. There's also something else that I want to acknowledge. We understand with regard to the Futuro program that many of you would like to see the status quo maintained. You've enjoyed the program, you believe it's successful for your children, and we respect that. We know that oftentimes, as people talk about change, they're often beginning from a place of, we want the status quo to be maintained because we like the status quo. We understand that. We've heard that repeatedly from so many people. But unfortunately, I want you to know this evening, while we're approaching this in a very respectful, collaborative manner, there are aspects of the Spanish Immersion Program that must change. And there are some things that we'd like to work with you on as we go into the next six to 12 months to find a way to make the program better, but also acknowledging and understanding that there are some components of the program that we do need to make adjustments to. So as we look at the Futuro program, and we've heard from so many of you that you believe this program is best for your children. I'm a parent, I have two children of my own, and I know that as a parent and as a father, I want what is best for my children, just as you do for your children. So we understand that. We get the perspective through which you are approaching this conversation. But as we talk about your children, I want you to know how much we believe that your children are our children. And we have to look at what is best for our students as a whole. And so when we talk about 
our students, we're talking about all students. So we want to find an avenue to improving instruction in this great school district for all students, both those who are in Spanish immersion as well as those who are not in Spanish immersion. And I believe that there are many different perspectives that are represented here this evening. So let me talk about what tonight is and is not. And I'll start with what tonight will not be. Tonight is not about long-term changes and implementations, okay? We're not going to discuss solutions this evening. We're not going to talk about next steps necessarily. We're not going to talk about what we propose to adjust in the program or what we might have discussed in October. We know that there are many of you here tonight who would like to lobby on behalf of Spanish immersion or perhaps talk about your opposition to Spanish immersion because what it means for your child. We understand that. But tonight, we're not here this evening to discuss what the program will look like in the future. When I said that there need to be adjustments, we're not going to decide those tonight. There's no vote tonight. We're not deciding anything as a part of this meeting or this conversation. But as we've listened to you over the last several weeks, I will acknowledge that we misstepped because while we have understood what the long-time challenges and implications of the program are, many of you have not. We've been privy to conversations that have evolved over the last six years where we have seen year by year mounting complexities related to Spanish immersion and the Spanish immersion's effect on our general ed or traditional approach. And we've compiled that information, that data, that body of knowledge over the last six years, but many of you have not had the benefit of understanding that. So that's what tonight is all about. We have to go back and help you understand the story and the context by which we approached some of the suggestions and the recommendations that you began to hear about this fall. So tonight is not about solutions. You don't have to worry about suggesting ways tonight that you think we can improve the program or address these challenges and these implications. Tonight is simply an opportunity for all of us to walk back through the story of Spanish immersion and what got us to this point and believing that there are some modifications that we need to make to the program for the benefit of all students. So that's what tonight is. So now, let me just kind of walk through what the agenda will be for this evening. You're going to meet the people who will be a part of the panel conversation. You're going to hear a very extensive presentation this evening. Throughout the last several weeks, we've had many people who have said, we want data. We want to know where did this recommendation come from? Why are you even suggesting changes to a program that you believe is great for your child or your children? So you're going to get a lot of data tonight. Data that has been compiled over the last six years but now data that is fresh and new information that we have that we can layer into that so that you understand what led all of us, including me, to support the recommendations and the adjustments that you heard earlier this fall. So that's the presentation. Uh, and I will admit that there will probably be elements of this information tonight and data that you'll hear that you'll still walk away or still would like to know more. We get that. Over the next six to 12 months, which we have committed to, that's what that process will be devoted to. Additional data that you may need as a part of a community conversation to help you and others understand why we would like to make some adjustments to the program. So there's a lot of data that you're gonna hear tonight. Quantitative data, as well as qualitative data. You're gonna get a wide gamut of information this evening but it probably will lead to more questions and that's okay because we've conceded that we're gonna step back and work with you over the next six to 12 months to study the program, to answer more questions and to provide more data. Tonight is just the beginning. Then after that, then we want to entertain any questions that you may have about the data and about the information that you hear this evening, okay? So again, we know that you have opinions and that many of you want to support the program, you want to speak on behalf of the program, or you want to speak about the concerns related to the program. We get that, but that's not what tonight is for. 
Tonight is for you to ask clarifying questions about the data and about the information shared this evening so that over the next six to 12 months, we know exactly where we all want to begin from, beginning from the same place so that we can all work towards a solution together. So when you came in, you probably saw there were cards provided with a QR code. Uh, you can share it with each other. It gives you the opportunity to submit questions. And if you don't have a phone or you're not comfortable with the technology, that's fine too. We've got individuals who also will provide you with a card that you can write your questions on. We're going to organize those by themes throughout this meeting. Many of the questions that you have will probably be answered tonight. But as I said, some of, them will, some of the information will lead to more questions, and that's okay. Then we're going to devote probably the last maybe quarter of tonight's meeting, again, with the objective of getting you out of here on a, at a reasonable time, to answering any questions that arise during this evening's meeting. Okay? We want to be fair. We want to be respectful. And we want to give you as much time and attention, but I hope that you'll now give time and attention to these individuals who have worked very hard on this presentation, including each of your four campus principals. And I'm going to turn it over now to Molly May, who is our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. She and her team have been working on this alongside the principals and the teachers. Molly's going to introduce them and then begin the presentation. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. I want to introduce our panel this evening. Um, we have Sherry Bryant, who is our principal at Bridgepoint, Laura Coxum, uh, principal at Cedar Creek, Leslie Ryan, ours our principal at Eanes Elementary, and Tiffany Phelps Shipman, our principal at Barton Creek. Um, I am the assistant superintendent, Molly May of the curriculum department, Chad Burnett, director of CIA, and Heather Meek, also one of our CIA directors. Uh, just quick overview, I won't go through this, but this is what the evening will look like, so you guys can kind of see an outline of the presentation that we'll be um, reviewing with you guys this, uh, this evening. I want to start off tonight, I know that we have some of our teachers in the audience, and I want to take a moment to really acknowledge our teachers and the work that they have done. And so, in <laughs> So in acknowledging our teachers, I just want you to know, and I think you can tell from that round of applause, that we all value all of our teachers. The teachers have been really honest and forthcoming in the information that we have asked um, from them. And so we've been talking to the teachers for a while. The teachers have come to us. They've come to their principals, shared some of their um, concerns and some of their struggles. The teachers work hard and they do their jobs really well. You're going to see tonight from some of the data that's provided that they are struggling and there's areas where they are acknowledging that they are not doing what we have asked them to do. And for a teacher to acknowledge that is very difficult. That does not mean that our students are not doing well, all of our students, and that they're all not progressing. But when we have teachers that come to us and say they're struggling, we want to be able to support them but we don't want them to feel like the fact that they have reached these challenges is their fault. And so that's our goal is to work with them and help support them. So as I mentioned, the students are progressing and learning in both our SI and our traditional classrooms. This presentation and the recommendations we've made are not based on our students not performing well. You're going to see data tonight that shows that overall our students are performing well and are performing above national benchmarks and national averages. But just because we're doing well doesn't mean we can't do better and doesn't mean we can't find ways to support our students and our teachers. With that being said, there's no blame. I know that sometimes the teachers, it's like, oh, I, I couldn't do what I was asked or the time, the time constraints are very difficult. No one is blaming anyone, and as I said, our teachers are working hard, the students are doing well, and so we're just here tonight to present facts and information and work toward problem solving. Each year is still a new year, in a, or sorry, it's still a pilot year with Spanish immersion. I know that when 
we adopted the program formally in 2019, people said, well, we've moved away from a pilot. But what you have to understand is every year is different as we've progressed this program up. So the TEKS are different, structures are different within departmentalization or not departmentalizing. There's just challenges in every single year. And so while it seems like perhaps it shouldn't be considered a pilot, it really has been for us every single year trying to figure out something that looks a little bit different than the year before. Additionally, it's important to note that Spanish immersion evolved during COVID. I had some questions of people saying, why in October of 2022 are you bringing these challenges to us when they've never been addressed before? Which they had been addressed in previous presentations and, and reports to the board. But as everyone knows, during COVID, we were all in a period of really just trying to survive. And so it took us a while, too, to get back to normal. We'll, you'll hear from anyone who you talk to in the field of education that this year feels like the first year of being back to normal. So during this time, we've had an opportunity to really look at what's going on in Spanish immersion and see some of those challenges that, quite honestly, we didn't address during COVID because we were really just trying to get through um, all of the challenges that we were facing with COVID. Our job as administrators is to recognize the barriers and challenges and support our teachers so they can support their students. And so I really just want to emphasize tonight that that truly is our goal. Our ultimate goal is your children. And we want to figure out a way to make sure that our teachers feel supported because as Dr. Arnett said, when our, when our leadership and our teachers are feeling good, feeling supported, have what they need, then all of our ch children are going to succeed. And then lastly, we want to create a sustainable program for all of our students to thrive that retains and attracts high quality staff. And that's our ultimate goal with everything that we're going to discuss and everything we're trying to reach tonight when we have this discussion. So I'm going to turn it over now to Heather Meek to discuss some of the background. Thank you, Molly. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, as Molly said, I'm Heather Meek, one of the curriculum directors here in Eanes. And some of you know me as Principal Meek, as I was um, the principal at Bridgepoint when we first began the program back in 2017. So I'm gonna share a timeline with you, and this timeline shows our journey as a district with Spanish immersion. Portions of this presentation and additional information have been shared in one board report or another over the past 13 years. You can see that if you go as far back as April of 2009 and then again in 2010, the first board reports were shared with the school board. And at that time, the school board did vote to not implement Spanish immersion. And then Spanish immersion was then revisited again in 2016 and at that time, I was part of a discovery committee that was put together to um, research information about Spanish immersion and implementing a pilot. And we, com we also um, d had that committee um, comprised of parents and staff that we took input from. Um, we began the implementation at Bridgepoint and Cedar Creek in 2017 and then added programs at Eanes and Barton Creek the following year. Since then, there have been four additional board reports shared with the community, and in 2019, we had another study group comprised of parents and teachers and staff um, where we looked at the program. So as one of the four original principals to start Spanish Immersion in Eanes, I'm honored and proud to highlight the benefits and the successes of the program. Based on research from the Center for Advanced Research on Language Acquisition, this slide explains the benefits of a foreign language immersion program. So there are academic uh, benefits. Um, we see immersion students, are, they're capable of performing as well as or in some cases better than their non-immersion peers on standardized math tests and reading measures. Um, English proficient um, uh, immersion students typically achieve higher on second language proficiency compared to students in other type of um, language programs. 
There are cognitive benefits. Um, bilingual children develop the ability to solve problems that contain conflicting or misleading cues at an earlier age. They demonstrate an advantage and uh, with selective attention and exhibit greater sensitivity to verbal and nonverbal cues and show greater attention to their listeners' needs relative to their monolingual children. Um, there are um, employment benefits that prepares our students for additional employment opportunities in a global economy, and it increases cultural competencies. So here we've captured some of the many prideful successes of the SI program here in Eanes across all four campuses. Um, we have ongoing commitments from administrators, staff, and our parents. Our Spanish learners are making progress, and they're, they're fully engaged in our program. They're becoming fluent. We have increased our kiddos' uh, opportunities for cultural awareness. We've seen sustained academic achievement, as Molly has already mentioned, and there has been a continued interest in the program. So when starting something additional or working through change, challenges need to be acknowledged in order to ensure that we're serving, serving all students the best we know how. So we first shared this research back in 2017 when we launched the pilot. It was important for us at that time to be clear and acknowledge the potential challenges so parents would have all the information that they would need when deciding if Spanish would immersion would be a good fit for their child. The research outlines challenges in regards to staffing and teacher preparation. Um, with that, the supports for assessment and intervention have been a little bit of a challenge. And then curriculum development as far as matching the resources to help the teachers outline the outline state standards have also been challenging. Finally, meeting the increased levels of learning variability when learning occurs between the two language, languages has also shown to be a challenge. So as I said, these have all been shared and they've all been shown to be a challenge here in EANS, but we have remained committed to working through them and we'll continue to do so with you. And now I'd like to invite Molly back up. She's gonna talk about, well, she's gonna tell you. I just wanted to refer um, back a little bit, as Dr. Arnett alluded to, we've been talking about Spanish immersion in the district since 2009. And so a very comprehensive report that was provided to the board around considerations for Spanish immersion at that time addressed these following um, considerations. And so they had talked about looking at, are we gonna be able to recruit um, our highly qualified teachers in terms of their certification, their expertise, and being able to um, work within whatever model we determine. Enrollment, how would we begin the program? What happens if we have attrition? What kind of demand would there be for the program? Transfers, um, at that time we talked about should there be a magnet program within EANS ISD? Would you pilot it? How would students be selected? What kind of transportation would be provided? Um, the facilities, looking at different buildings in terms of capacity and program feasibility, um, budget implications, this goes back to possibly, you know, if you had a facility and you wanted to do a magnet program, what would that look like? Time, this was a really big factor in one of the considerations was um, most of the research was really saying that in order to have an effective Spanish immersion program, there needed to be an extended day. So the consideration around that was, are you extending the day for just the students in Spanish immersion? Are you, if you pilot it, would it just be at those certain school, at a certain school? If we piloted at multiple schools, would it be at all of those schools? If you had a magnet school, would the magnet school just have additional time? So that again was a consideration that we were trying to talk about, what would it look like to be able to successfully implement a Spanish immersion program? And if we had to add time, what would that look like? And then lastly, it was just around achievement. A lot of the data showed that um, when, especially when you're doing a model more of a 90-10, where the students are getting more of the target language, in this case, Spanish, they do tend to have slower development. 
um, academically the first couple years, and then they catch up. Um, and so there was just a consideration of, you know, would everybody be okay with that? What would that look like? And so these were the considerations that were presented in 2009. At that time, the board decided not to proceed with the Spanish Immersion Program. Obviously, we have now, again, all the successes that Heather talked about. But some people have asked us, you know, we've never heard about these challenges. This is the first time this is coming up. And so we just wanted to emphasize that even though we had these challenges in 2009, we still decided in 2016, 2017 to go ahead with the program. But some of these still are the challenges that we face today. I'm going to turn it over now to Laura. If Sherry, you're not the only one that's going to have to move the microphone. I had to, too. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, well, as Molly mentioned, that there have been some historical presentations of challenges over the years through different board meetings. Um, and so Heather had shared that what the research says you may experience within an immersion program. Um, and these are some of the challenges that we have specifically seen here in EANS and shared throughout the years, but we wanted to kind of compile them together for you. Um, so some of the challenges that we have faced here are the recruitment and retention of teachers and substitutes. Um, as you guys know, that's an incredibly important factor in your child's education, so we have seen challenges with that. Um, the parity of sections, class sizes, staffing, and supports um, when you're looking at our Spanish Immersion Program and our traditional program and what those differences may be and what that staffing looks like. Funding and resources. So, of course, there's a cost to a program and specific resources needed for teaching Spanish instruction. So that's been a challenge as well. The access and supports for diverse needs and populations. So, of course, our goal is for all students to be successful. So making sure that we've got the supports needed um, and access for every student who desires to be in the program that still may need some supports. Professional learning communities, we call them our PLCs, and professional development. So ensuring that our teachers that are within the Spanish Immersion Program have access to high quality professional development and have a community to go through all of that with. So. And that's a pretty established process for all of our teachers. You've got grade level PLCs or departments, and we wanted to make sure that that was happening for our Spanish teachers. And that has been a challenge because you are often the only teacher at that grade level on your campus <coughs> teaching that content. Um, inequities between immersion and traditional, so within students and staff. And um, we're going to dive into some of these a lot more, so you're getting a high level here. Um, but we'll dive into that one. Meeting the needs of students in all programs. The division among parents, that was uh, more prevalent, especially at the beginning of the program. I think we've had a lot of growth there, but it is a challenge we faced. Um, the scheduling or the model, uh, particularly in fifth grade and in middle school, um, when you're creating fifth grade classes, we are pretty much running a middle school schedule when you throw in the layer of Spanish immersion. So which block do the kids go to and making sure that they're getting the right math class, but also getting immersion and balancing the class sizes, it's a challenge. Um, curricular resources, so again, making sure that they have access to high quality materials and the correct materials that they need for their course. Instructional minutes and language development. So um, we're going to dive into some of these. And first, I'm going to give it to Sherry to talk more about instructional minutes. Great. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Hi, I'm Sherry Bryant. I'm the principal of Bridgepoint Elementary. And as Heather said, she um, was the principal when we first started, and I was our assistant principal. So I, um, you know, have been a part of Spanish Immersion from the very beginning, which I am very proud of. Um, so I'm going to just take you through um, the history of all the different schedules and um, why some of those decisions were made and then how we have changed. Every year we've made adjustments to um, capture just the different needs and to accommodate for things like compacted math in fifth grade, for example. So um, as Heather said, when we first started on this journey, um, a committee of parents and teachers went to different programs in AISD a group of people went to Utah to visit the Utah model, 
And what we landed on as a district was a 50-50 model, which is modeled after what they do in Utah. And we decided that 50% of our students' day, instructional day, would be spent in English learning language arts and social studies. And then the other 25% would be in Spanish learning math. And then the other 25% science in Spanish. And I think, you know, in kindergarten, that works beautifully because everyone is, has a lot to learn. You're working on routines. Um, the teaks aren't as demanding. A lot of our kids in Eames come in knowing their letters and sounds. They know how to read. They know how to add. They can count. And so I think that that, that model um, is probably pretty successful in kindergarten. As we started to go through the different grades and add a grade every year, one of the things that we realized that if you're going to do math in Spanish, you have to be able to read in Spanish. And so we figured out that we need to build in Spanish literacy. And if our kids are truly going to be biliterate, they have to read, write, and speak. And so, um, you know, that presented a challenge because we needed more time in the Spanish language to develop those skills. Additionally, math became pretty difficult when you're doing it in another language, and some of that academic vocabulary that kids weren't familiar with needed to be reinforced in English. And so when you start adding reinforcement, you have to take away from the day, because we still only have seven hours. And so um, I will say also most, um, most programs are a 90-10 model where you're fully immersed 90% of the day in the target language, which in our case would be Spanish, and then 10% of the day is English. And so um, at the time, the Utah model of 50-50 is what was decided. So then, as the program progressed, Bridgepoint and Cedar Creek added first grade, and Eames and Barton Creek began their journey in kinder. And you know, some of these more, uh, some of these challenges started to to pop up. Um, as I mentioned before, the need for math reinforcement in English took place. And while this can build students' confidence in math in Spanish, when you add something, you have to take something away. And so in this case, time was taken away from the language arts and social studies instructional minutes. And so um, another kind of logistical thing that happened is the English teacher is now reinforcing math, but the English teacher wasn't in the room to teach the math initially. And so that teacher doesn't necessarily understand any misconceptions or specific challenges the students may have had when they got the math instruction initially from the Spanish teacher. And so all of these things, you know, had been talked about in PLCs, and, and so we were constantly just trying to problem solve. Um, but again, we still only have, you know, seven hours. Um, additionally, you'll see that then we start to get misaligned with instructional minutes. And so if you look at a student on the traditional side, for example, they probably are getting that full two-hour block of language arts, and our Spanish immersion kids are having to spend some of that language arts time getting math reinforcement. And so that's where you start to see the inequities in the guaranteed and viable curriculum. So then we started to talk about fourth and fifth grade. And in fourth and fifth grade, this is when um, a lot of our campuses start departmentalizing, meaning your teacher, your student might have a math teacher, might have a language arts teacher, a science teacher. Then things get really tricky because nobody wants to give up their minutes. And so um, this model was developed. You can still see there's a black line going through the middle of it, demonstrating the 50-50, but you see that teachers are now teaching multiple subjects and having to reinforce things that they initially weren't part of the original instruction. And so while this may look great on a pie chart, in practice 
it became pretty difficult. Um, Cedar Creek and I added fifth grade this year, and that presented another set of challenges because it means something that we're really proud of is offering multiple math courses. So in fifth grade, um, math five is offered, math five six is offered, which is when two years are compacted into one year. And then some of our students even take math six seven, meaning they completely skip math five and go right into a compacted six seven class. And so one of the things that we all felt really sure of is that we knew that we couldn't say Spanish immersion students couldn't take part of in that. And so we made the decision to completely flip the model in fifth grade and have our students who are in Spanish immersion now get their English language arts and social studies in Spanish. Um, as you can imagine, our students have been asked to read or write in Spanish, so that has been um, difficult um, to make that change and also difficult for our Spanish immersion teachers in fifth grade because they are now the only person on the campus doing that model. They can't go down to the fourth grade Spanish immersion teacher and necessarily talk about language arts because they're the only person on the campus um, doing that. Um, I will be really honest with you. Um, this model, this picture, um, is not realistic. Um, because of our block scheduling, students spend 120 hours in language arts, and our language arts teachers need all 120 minutes. Our math teachers have 60 minutes, and our science teachers have 60 minutes. And so, if you'll notice in the model, it talks about how Spanish science is supposed science in Spanish is supposed to be happening, but my my language arts fifth grade Spanish immersion teacher doesn't teach science and um, needs her 120 minutes to instruct her students in language arts. So next, I will turn it over to Miss um, Phelps, and she will talk to you more. Hi, I'm Tiffany Phelps, proud principal of Barton Creek Elementary School. I have been there for six years, so that means five of the years that Spanish Immersion has been on our campus, it's been me as the leader. Not only am I the principal, I am also the parent of a Spanish Immersion student myself. My daughter is now in second grade at Barton Creek in the SI program. And I, just like you, enjoy the dinner conversations, the songs, her critiquing my poquito espanol. Um, so I, I totally, you don't have to sell me on how wonderful the program is, I got that. The challenge for me and the unique position that I'm in is that I'm also the leader of the school. And so I have an obligation to make sure that I am very clear and share and honor all perspectives for all my staff and all my students. So today I'm tasked with going over some of the challenges that were laid out, particularly about instructional time. I, like you, listened to the board presentation that was given where the, the successes were clearly articulated. And while we were very proud about that, um, we did not feel like all of the ch challenges were portrayed. So I understand why y'all are sitting here today feeling like it came out of left field. The challenges that we heard and listened to, I can only speak for myself, were over the course of five years with several different teachers, Spanish immersion teachers come and go, traditional teachers come and go. Some traditional teachers chose to get out of the program and go back into a traditional classroom, which we honored. So know that this was not in an isolation. This was not as was mentioned, a committee of three. This was collective experience and expertise in this domain. We listened to 
teacher feedback. We constantly are dealing with the challenges of a master schedule. That thank goodness Sherry was the one that told y'all about the pie charts because I'm not sure I would have done it as eloquently. But the master schedule does become a challenge. We listened through our PLC times. Um, we just constantly are gathering information. So I want to share, because I owe it to the teachers to share some of their quotes, and I'm pretty sure I just messed up this presentation because it's not progressing. <laughs> Instead of me speaking on behalf of the teachers, I am going to share some direct quotes that were given to us from the teachers. The Spanish side immersion teachers have said the following. There is not enough time on the Spanish side for literacy and science in the same day. There are weeks where we don't teach science. There is no time for Spanish literacy, morning meetings, or transitions. We do not have enough Spanish resources. The Spanish side has a whole Spanish literacy adoption to integrate and not enough time to deliver the instruction. With a slower pace of math and science and Spanish, plus literacy, I'm concerned I won't be able to cover all the necessary material with the same depth and att attention that I normally would have. Again, this is just reflective of a few. I acknowledge that this is not all. More qualitative data from our English side immersion teachers. There is not enough time on the English side for a full social studies lesson, along with math and science vocabulary reinforcement. Small groups are what gets cut. I have come to the conclusion that you cannot fit everything in that we are expected to teach. Time constraints for all subjects to be met is overwhelming. I promise they exist. I sometimes have to cut out independent reading or get behind in grammar. Sometimes I am a week or a week and a half behind the traditional side. Qualitative data from Spanish and English side immersion teachers continued. 44 students is overwhelming. We are responsible for 44 students each day, which doubles the number of families and conferences and emails. Most of the time, we are not at the same place with our PLC because of our specific schedule. The SI program should have a two-week window in order to catch up with our monolingual classrooms. Time is not split evenly between morning and afternoon groups. Too many transitions causes lost time. If students didn't finish their work, they won't see it again until the next day. We'll have to either reteach or, re or refresh their memory of the assignment the next day, which takes time. They are constantly having to stop and resume work. Time, time, time. So some things that you can observe when you have the privilege of going in and out of the classrooms are th things that are seemingly so simple. If a project, the kids are in the middle of a creative project, and it's time to switch, they switch. They don't get to finish it. They don't get to ask questions. They're constantly cleaning up to move on to the next class. If you've experienced five and six-year-olds at home with cleaning their room, you know that that can be a challenge. So they're constantly on a time constraint, which causes a lot of stress for not only our staff, but also our students. You've heard enough from me. I'm going to turn it over to Leslie Ryan. Hi everyone, where are the Mustangs? Have any Mustangs been? Woo woo! All right, I'm Leslie Ryan, I'm the principal of Eanes Elementary. I see a young Mustang back there, welcome. Um, we're glad you're here tonight. I uh, wanted to start by just acknowledging and honoring um, and celebrating our students and our staff. Um, our teachers work so incredibly hard. Like Molly said earlier, um, the work that they do is sometimes, it feels like a thankless job. They dedicate themselves every single day to coming in and doing the very best for every child in their classroom. And that is really what we try to embody as um, all four of our campuses, all nine of our campuses, all 10 spaces where learning takes place here in Eanes ISD um, to honor that all means all. And so I've, I've got a script. I've got to get back to my script. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, with that being said, there are some resources um, that our teachers, uh, specifically on the Spanish side, shared <laughs> that were seemingly constraints um, that were hindering their ability to really 
feel like they were doing the best every day for every single kid, which is, you take that home with you as an educator. Um, it's not, you don't leave it at the door. So some of those uh, resources that our teachers on the Spanish side shared um, that really became, are becoming constraints, certainly are time. Um, also they shared um, professional development, materials, but time, 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 time kept coming up. This is quantitative, so you can see, you know, in terms of percentages who responded in, in these areas. Uh, but similar to, similar to what Tiffany shared, uh, time was a theme that ran throughout. All right, so on our English side, you have some similar pieces of data. You see that professional development is an area of opportunity. You see that time continues to be a constraint that limits them in being able to really feel like they can fully flesh out lessons to serve all of their students. Um, and again, professional development in, in our materials were areas that, that came up as well. So more on that later, but now we're gonna transition to Chad, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about um, our instructional time in a deeper way. Good luck with this mic, it keeps falling. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, good evening, everyone. If I uh, sniff or cough, I do apologize. I do have a head cold. Um, and, and I promise I have some, some, to, some to give to you besides being the man in the middle of all your screenshot pictures that you, you have been taking throughout this presentation. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about the actual implications on this instructional time that we keep kind of talking about over the last couple of presentations. Before I do that, though, um, I have the privilege of going over some academic data. Um, I do want to preface this by saying, as a teacher, as an educator, um, sharing academic data sometimes can um, be a little scary, a little revealing, um, and, and I equate it to going to the doctor when you have a physical and you might not be ready for that physical. Um, the data does tell you something that you need to adjust or get moving forward on, but sometimes it can look a little harsher than it really is. Um, and, and we're going to do two data points today. We're going to talk a little bit about historical data that is a perfect example of why instructional minutes matter and how some of these um, constraints within our instructional model are not allowing us to address some of these concerns. And then we're going to look at actual growth data for our current cohorts of students over time um, and point out some of the great things our teachers are doing. And then a couple of areas that we're just monitoring to ensure that we don't have the, 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 the decline in the academic growth as we see in our first example. So our first example is our um, last six years of our fifth grade science star exam. Now you may have heard this example at the board meeting in October that I tried to give. Did not go over so eloquently, so I'll do a little bit better this time. Our fifth grade science star scores have been decreasing over the past six years. State put it in a context that for you to better understand, we went from 20 to 25 students failing that exam annually to over 100 kids failing the, the exam last year. That goes from one section of fifth grade students to an entire campus of fifth grade students failed the Science Star last year. Not one campus, scattered amongst all six, but this is a direct result of the loss of instructional time over the past five, six years. So when you lose instructional time, it does affect you long-term academically. It does take a while to get back on track. And as you've heard from our principals here before, we are being told consistently from our Spanish immersion teachers that they're having a hard time fitting science into daily instruction. So the way to address this is to implement a consistent daily instructional minutes in the science. And because of the constraints of our model, we're asking them to do something that does not quite actually work. Um, and so over time, we're seeing that this, this, our teachers are struggling to teach science routinely. However, when they do do it, they do a phenomenal job in doing so. And when they, they do it when they're able and they have and they can fit it into their system. Next, we're going to look at our NWA MAPS growth data. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry. Sorry. Spanish Merchant hasn't taken this yet. So this is the historical six years. So our fifth grade this year will be the first SI group to take this exam. So, yeah, um, maybe I'll explain a little bit more. Historically, 
Why this has gone down is because we have been losing that instructional time within the classroom. So we're going to look at our MAPS data. We're going to look at, our, at the academic impact. Wait. Yeah, yeah. It's because we've already cut instructional time in science as a district, and so we're demonstrating what's happened when you've cut the instructional time. So if we're going to cut more instructional time for Spanish immersion students, expect to see a trend. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's look at our trajectory, our learn, our growth trajectory over time when it comes to actual SI students and the NWA MAP scores that we do annually here at Eanes. Um, what you'll notice at the chart is historical spring MAP writ growth over time, and you'll start with your cohort at the top left. This is our current second graders, and then you have current third graders, current fourth graders, and our current fifth graders. The chart, project, the chart shows projection of growth from year to year. In yellow, or sorry, in blue, is our Spanish immersion students' growth trajectory from year to year. In orange is our the traditional peers' growth trajectory from year to year. And the gray line is the national growth trajectory for the students within that same grade. As always, our students do a phenomenal job on this assessment when compared especially to national norms. And as a district, we are continuing to see these strong annual score growth over time that we've seen historically. This is a direct result of our teachers and the hard work that they have put in, SI and our traditional side. Within most of our grades, this growth trajectory for the SI and traditional cohort mirrors one another. However, if you look at this English model, the fifth grade Spanish immersion annual growth has slowed as compared to the traditional side. At the end of fourth grade last year, current fifth graders, the traditional cohort actually caught up to the Spanish immersion peers in their reading maps performance. If we move to the same charts in math, we look at our growth trajectories from second to third to fourth to fifth. We can also see that these growth trajectories mirror each other in our current second and fourth grade cohorts. In our current third grade, the traditional cohort growth last year outpaced our Spanish immersion cohort's growth. And if you look at our fifth grade, our fifth grade cohort right now in Spanish immersion is being outpaced by the traditional side, so much so over the past two years, the traditional side is now outperforming our SI students. The difference in annual growth is not a result of our teachers not teaching or not knowing what they're doing, this is a direct result of those instructional time constraints that we just talked about. When you're having to, to make decisions, how much math do I teach? How much science do I teach? It does matter and will matter over time and show up. We hope to see a consistent growth across both cohorts every year. While this instructional minutes difference may seem insignificant, it is cumulative over time. So let's take a classroom where you miss 10 minutes of instruction average daily. That 10 minutes over one year equates to 20 instructional days lost. So even though it may seem minimal at, a at the time of the loss of that instruction, it will accumulate over time, and it, it's very hard even for the best skilled teacher to catch up with that much time lost over a school year. Next, I'm turning over to Heather to talk about professional learning. So just like learning and um Learning opportunities for our kids are important. It is critical for all staff as well. And um, we've had several challenges um, pertain to professional learning. And I just want to start by saying in Texas, um, the only programs that serve students, um, or the only programs that, that we get funding for, for um, students that are learning a second language are, th are the kiddos that are trying to learn English. So our, our program looks a little bit different. Um, we have native speakers trying to learn um, Spanish. And with that, um, we need to provide a lot of meaningful training for our staff because some of the bilingual teachers that we have coming to this program um, aren't used to teaching in this program. So we need to provide meaningful and relevant training for them and there's nothing that the state offers so we've had to look from to the outside um, there are different levels of teacher expertise that we have to plan for 
And then you have to remember, we've been adding staff every single year as we've brought in the next grade level. And so that's made it challenging to plan. Um, offering professional development in the summer is ideal when we want to gather teachers from all the different campuses to come together and share and learn. But we often find ourselves still hiring for Spanish immersion in August, all the way up until when school starts. And we start that hiring process in February. So um, it ha that part has not been easy. And then historically, not all of our teachers have atta attend our training in the summer for one reason or another, just with all of the different commitments and other trainings that happen. Um, there have been frequent changes to the model. This has been especially difficult for someone in my position and as a building principal when trying to plan. When the model keeps changing, we feel like it's very reactive and we can't get in front of it. Um, so just adding those additional training for the, the reinforcement in literacy and math and the times that we've changed. We've moved teachers around from grade level to in response to some of that too, sometimes over the summer last minute. So they miss out on critical change, uh, training. One of the things that we use to combat the lack of training in the summer is planning time during the year when our PLCs gather, and but they're together on a campus. It's really hard to get everybody together off campus. With our sub shortages, we don't have enough subs to support teachers being instructed in PD throughout the school day during the school year. And the last part is our training model has been focused on Utah. We decided to do the Utah motto, model. We've used their state model. We've been using trainers from their state too. Just we, we want to hear it straight from the horse's mouth on how to do this. Um, teachers have historically shared throughout that they need more training. And in response, we have spent six times the allocated amount budgeted for training over the last two years for Spanish Immersion PD. And even though we've gone over by six times, we are still finding that there is a lack of generalization due to different state expectations, different state supports, different district expectations. There's even differences in the training and the teacher certifications between the two states. So, um, Again, we received no instructional or financial support for our SI program because Texas considers it an additional program. Spanish immersion in Utah is state supported, and that model seemed ideal in 2017, but we have found that it is very difficult to implement that model with fidelity here in Texas, especially from a curricular standpoint. So now I'm going to invite uh, Laura up and she's gonna talk about retention and recruitment. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't know if any of you are uh, data nerds or research nerds, but if you've ever read um, like John Hattie's research on the effect size, the factor in a child's education that has the single greatest impact on them is their teacher. So one of our goals has always been to recruit and retain high quality certified, qualified teachers that are ready to take your child to where they need to be. And that has been a challenge within our Spanish Immersion program. So over the course of our program, past six years, our attrition rate has been 64% for our Spanish teachers. Um, as Heather just outlined, that process of making sure that we're training, bringing our teachers on to what EANS in general plus EANS Spanish Immersion there's um, a high, heavy lift there for um, cost-wise, for man hours, and making sure that our teachers are ready for your children. So that's a pretty significant rate of turnover that equates to the loss of 14 teachers over those six years. Um, of that, seven of those teachers have left mid-year and have needed to be replaced um, during the course of the school year. As you can imagine, any time a teacher leaves mid-year, it is less than ideal and it's a challenging time to hire, but then you have an added challenge of needing to hire a bilingual teacher, bilingual certified teacher as well. Um, there have been several job fairs, so big colleges and universities have job fairs, we go represent, I've been at some of them this past fall, and talked to zero bilingual candidates at those job fairs, and we're talking UT, Texas State, A&M, um, that bilingual elementary certification, we didn't talk to anyone. It doesn't mean they don't exist. There's obviously people in programs, but 
when you took look at quantity in comparison, there weren't any at the job fairs in the spring or fall. Um, we also, as Heather mentioned, with that PD piece, having substitutes in general is a challenge, but specifically Spanish-speaking substitutes is a challenge. So we want to provide that continuity of instruction, and when your child's teacher needs to be out of the building for whatever reason, our ideal scenario is having a Spanish-speaking substitute. Um, there aren't as many of those. They're hard to find. It's hard to find subs in general, but especially our Spanish-speaking subs. So sometimes that means your child's day looks really different if there's a sub because it's an English-speaking sub. And we never do math in English. Why are we doing math in English today? It's, it's a different routine for your child. So that's a challenge we faced. Um, if you look at the Central Texas area schools and vacancies as of November 2022, there were 97 bilingual teacher vacancies. So we are very fortunate that we are fully staffed across immersion right now in EANS, um, but you can see the teacher shortage is real. There are 97 classrooms without a bilingual teacher in them right now in Central Texas. And we do compete for the same talent pools. So one of those pieces that has really contributed to that challenge is that increasing stipend for bilingual teachers. We have seen this go up and up in other districts around us. And with cost of living on the rise, it makes a big difference to a teacher now when they're making a decision on that $4,000 difference in a stipend in another district might mean a lot for their family. And so that is a challenge when we look at that recruitment and retention piece. Um, this past school year, we had to hire seven Spanish-speaking vacancies across our six campuses. And we had 16 qualified people to, that, that was our candidate pool. So fortunately, we did find seven in our 16. But as you can imagine, it's about a one in two when you're interviewing. Our rate for traditional looks very different. So um, that candidate pool is just different. And we've been very fortunate to have wonderful, amazing teachers in our classrooms. And our goal is to be able to continue that. So we want to keep retaining the talent that we have here in EANS and continuing to recruit that level of talent from our current Spanish teachers. And I am going to turn it over to Leslie to talk about program inequities. Okay. So before I dive in to the data, I think that one of the pieces that um, – the four of us would probably all agree on, aside from finding the very best educators to teach your children, is making sure that the students we have in the class it, classes are a healthy balance, right? We wanna make sure that the composition of each and every classroom is balanced, equitable, and that we can best serve all of their needs. I would say that following hiring the best teachers is the next most important job that I have other than keeping everyone safe. And so I know that as a parent of a child who is at Cedar Creek, I trust that Laura is looking at all of the students as they're placing them in and getting teachers input uh, to make sure that that's the best dynamics to serve our students. So when we're looking at splitting up 88 students into four classes, it looks one way. When we're looking at splitting 88 students, 44 into one, 44 into another, into those two duos, the ways in which we can mix our students up so that they can have exposure to other peers and have exposure to other styles of learning is more limited. And so that really is what we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides and just making sure that the classroom environment is one that um, can best serve the students um, and that the teacher can meet and reach the needs of all of our learners. So this is currently what we have in place. Um, and with this being said, so you can see on the top, we have our Spanish immersion, total number of students, and then within that, the demographics of special education and 504 plans, as well as our emergent bilingual students. And on the second column, or second row, excuse me, you'll see the traditional students within our, our school communities. And this is across our four campuses and the students in which, uh, the campuses in which we have Spanish immersion. So, what you can see is that there is a difference in our numbers. You have a higher percentage of students served in special education or with a 504 plan or your ELL, emergent bilingual students. That concentration is a bit higher in our Spanish immersion sections. Now, with that being said, as a parent, when I sent my, my child to kindergarten and I was planning for him to enroll in kindergarten the upcoming year, 
he was four. I didn't know what his learning needs would be, right? I think a lot of our families experience that. When they enroll their child, they anticipate these big goals for their kiddos, and maybe there are some areas of opportunity or growth that their child has that they couldn't have been anticipated. And so perhaps they need additional accommodations within a 504 plan. Perhaps they need a specialized modified instruction for their child within, within special education. And so our responsibility is to best serve those students with the plans that best serve their needs. And so with that being said, there are times that we meet with families. I know the four of us have met with families who have really grappled with, we're enrolled in Spanish immersion. We really feel passionately about this program. Our child has needs that differ from what the service this program can provide and support them with. And we need to have that conversation. And we really try to open that space so that we can have an open dialogue to best serve their child's needs. And so we're purposeful in making sure that if we are doing any movement, where a student's moving from one setting to the other, that we're really thoughtful, that we've made sure to exhaust all of those supports that we can put in place. Um, but as a principal, if a parent comes to me and we have this in-depth conversation about a family's child and the needs that that child might have, I trust that you, as the child's parent, have your child's best interest in mind. And so there's movement that takes place. With that being said, you then have one portion with your SI, two classes, where your enrollment and your numbers decrease, and then you have an increase in your numbers on your traditional side. So you can see that you're already, your number in balance goes off a little bit as the year goes on. The programming differs from side to side. And so it is something that we have heard from students and families and, and teachers that that's been a challenge to best serve in those traditional settings um, all of their children's needs. So based on the survey data that we receive from our traditional teachers, you can see that 58% um, of these teachers felt that the Spanish Immersion Program and model currently that we have in place impacts the learning in the traditional students. Um, additionally, they feel like those classes are not equally balanced. Um, sometimes that's a balance of numbers, sometimes that's a balance of programming. Um, as I said earlier, our goal as educators is to meet the needs of all of our students. There's that strong sense of responsibility that we come and bring with us every day. And so they feel that passionately that they want to be able to meet the needs of all of their students. And so that's something that um, they shared. Molly, you're up next. So continuing with um, speaking about some of the program inequities, and one of the, uh, the slide you saw previously with the um, English or the traditional side teachers talking about the stipends. So there is inequity with our stipends. So you can see for our Spanish-speaking teachers, in order to stay competitive, which we need to do in this area, Laura alluded to that earlier, you can see their stipends have gone from $3,000 to $6,000 a year um, in what we've had to do over the years to stay competitive. For our English-speaking teacher stipends, we started at $3,000 and then we've stayed at $4,500 um, for that particular stipend. On the traditional side, uh, teacher and also our collaborative special education teachers, at this time we are not offering stipends. And again, we want to stipend everyone a million dollars if we can, but we can't. And so they're budget constraints. And so those are things that we have to look at. And when you're trying to look at what are the most competitive jobs out there, those are the jobs that we are typically stipending um, as a district and what we are able to afford to do. And so that, that is a challenge that we are facing um, with our teachers. To provide equity and stipends for all of the staff educating all of our children. I'm going to go on with my presentation um, and we'll do questions at the end. Thank you. In terms of our trends, we are seeing that we are looking at um, up to, in, in competitive districts or districts around us, up to $10,000 a year for bilingual stipends. And so that is becoming, you know, a very, very competitive, very expensive um, opportunity to hire those teachers. And we want to retain um, and attract the highest quality teachers there are. Additionally, we're seeing signing bonuses and stipends being offered for all special education teachers. 
So as a district, um, as, a, as a country um, in the state, you're seeing the stipends becoming very competitive and just something that's, that's hard for us to always um, consider and, and compete with our surrounding districts. Some information related to the stipends is a new to professional, professional bilingual teacher makes the same as a 17-year veteran when you factor in that stipend. So that is something that, as you can imagine, a teacher teaching for 17 years and then having someone come in as a first-year teacher and making the same amount of pay, that, that is something, again, that creates some inequity. And when we mentioned earlier, you know, we're looking for, at all of our teachers um, to make sure that we're being as equitable as, as possible. Um, and again, our current SI stipends, both for Spanish and English, are above the master's degree and doctorate level stipends that we offer for our teachers. So again, people have asked us for some information and some data, and we just wanted to provide this. The changes that we recommended in October were not based on these financial considerations, but this is important that we brought this to the community because we wanted the community to understand some of the things that as administration we also have to determine and grapple with. I'm going to move on to some other financial considerations. And again, I just want people to understand the district is committed to Spanish immersion as a program, and we're not looking to get rid of Spanish immersion. But we do have to look at these costs when we talk about the program and the implications for our entire district. Some of the challenges that we face financially are we're seeing increased costs really in every area related to education in general, but Spanish immersion. We've seen increased costs in our professional development. We've hired an educational partner, an additional position to help support the program and help support our teachers. We've had to um, purchase several more instructional materials than we had and resources than we had additionally anticipated, especially when we added in our literacy program within the Spanish immersion program to make sure our teachers have the resources they need. And they need those resources, and we're committed to providing them high-quality resources, but again, this is an expense that was not originally contemplated. The stipends, again, are another financial consideration. We do have two dedicated substitutes that, we, that are Spanish-speaking that we use to support our Spanish immersion program, specifically hired just to help our Spanish um, immersion program, excuse me, program when we have either an absence or, again, if we're trying to pull those teachers for PLC. There is an additional, um, sometimes we are adding an additional section because of Spanish immersion due to how we are dividing up the number of students and we may have to be carrying an additional um, teacher to make sure that we have equitable distribution of the, class or the classes. So that can be an additional cost um, from year to year and that just depends on the particular school year. This is just a chart that sort of shows um, some projections that had been made over time. So for projected costs of the 2021 and 22 school year, in 2019, the report to the board estimated that the cost of that school year for Spanish immersion could be $266,000. In the um, report done in April of 2020, the projected cost was $387,000. At the end of that school year, the 21-22 school year, the actual cost of the program was $461,000. So again, just showing, I know some people had reached out to us and said, you know, that the Spanish Immersion Program may be um, actually making money for the district or that it didn't cost, you know, as much as maybe we had anticipated. So again, we wanted just to provide district to the community, provide data to the community around these costs. Um, we do bring in and attract transfer students for the Spanish Immersion Program. We have probably many of um, those parents here tonight. We value our transfer students. We want to continue to have our transfer students. And so I don't want to negate the fact that they do bring in um, additional dollars with them. And so for the 21-22 school year, just showing that additional money that those, that those um, transfer students bring in. And obviously, the more transfer students you bring in, the more dollars that come with them. So we don't want to negate that, but we also just wanted to show the data about the cost of the program. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Chad, and he's going to discuss the middle school model. Well, 
Okay, I'm going to quickly go over the uh, middle school model as was presented last spring. Our Spanish Immersion students will move to the middle school with much more advanced communication skills um, than our traditional students that take Spanish 1 in a traditional Spanish 1 class. Um, because of those advanced skills and then some needs from some other skills for development, we are going to develop a special class called Immersion Spanish 2A to offer to sixth graders. This course will be an in-depth Spanish course created differently than any other Spanish course that we offer at Eans ISD. We are hoping to capitalize on the strengths that they develop from the elementary Spanish immersion program and then foster some of the development in the other areas that students may need, especially what referring back to what Ms. Bryant talked about is enhancing their writing and reading skills within Spanish. Because of these advanced skills, we'll be able to also incorporate cultural exploration activities, We'll be able to enhance the student's ability for written and oral communication within the target language and develop their professional communi communication skills in Spanish. From, a span uh, from Immersion Spanish 2A, the students will then move into Immersion Spanish 2B in seventh grade. And upon completion of Spanish 2B, those students will then have fulfilled the requirements for high school graduation. If a student wishes to continue on the Immersion journey, they can then take Immersion Spanish 3 in eighth grade. There are a couple things to keep in mind when you think about a middle school program. Um, we want our students to keep advancing in Spanish credits for high school, past elementary, but in order to do that, they must be enrolled in an actual Spanish course. A bilingual course does not award a, a student a Spanish credit. So bilingual science does only awards a science credit. They must sit for an actual Spanish course that was instructed by a highly qualified teacher that has the content certification to do that within for that language other than Spanish. So our bilingual, if we have a bilingual social studies teacher, they may be qualified only to teach social studies in Spanish. Bilingual certification alone does not qualify a teacher to teach a language other than English for a high school credit. As mentioned earlier by Heather, Texas does not have a formal pathway outlined or defined to support the extension of a dual language learning program into the middle school or into the high school. And now I'm gonna turn it actually back over to Molly, right? So what are the next steps? We appreciate everyone so much for being here this evening and we've um, seen the questions that have come in so we know there are many and we will do our best tonight to answer some of those and provide additional follow-up to the questions that we aren't able to get to. As Dr. Net Arnett articulated in his letter, we are going to spend the next six to 12 months reconsidering all of the challenges that we have. We have instructional strategies that the teachers are facing, we have inequities in the program, and we hope to have a better understanding of all of these um, challenges and outline recommendations to come for in the next year. We will be moving away from the Utah model as we've discovered the difficulties taking a system from another state and applying it to EANS. We've already been in contact with our regional service center and of some of the local universities to come in and try to partner with us as we look at our program to see what we can do to really look at the instructional model. We have received so many emails Pouring, outpouring of support for the Spanish Immersion Program, and we know how much you care about the program and your students, and we know from the board meeting how invested you are in helping us partner and try to find some solutions to, the, to these challenges. So we appreciate the willingness on your part to partner with us, and we will keep you informed of the progress, and as we proceed, when there's ways for the parents to be involved, we will absolutely reach out and communicate to you of where we're headed and how we can get support from the community. But we sincerely appreciate everyone being here this evening and we hope we've outlined some of the challenges. As I said, some people were questioning where did these challenges come from? We just wanted to let you guys know we are still committed to the Spanish Immersion Program. We started off with the successes because we want you to we want to acknowledge that we know the benefits of Spanish Immersion we know the successes of our program. We want to try to figure out how to capitalize on those successes, but also move forward on the areas where we're really struggled, struggling and really are challenges for us. So at this point, we're going to um, open it up to some questions. 
And I think um, Dr. Nett is going to ask some of those questions. The panel will try to answer them. I don't know that we'll get to all of them, but we will we'll do our best. All right, Molly and our panel, thank you very much. So dozens of questions have come in throughout the evening, which is understandable. And as Molly said, it would be difficult for us to get to all of those questions. Many of them do replicate each other. The good thing is, is that the questions that you have directed at us this evening, we're going to use those to then compile a frequently asked questions document in response to this evening. Tonight's presentation will be fully available online. All of the slides, the data that you've seen here this evening will be available on our website shortly. The video of tonight's presentation will also be available online. It takes us a few more days to do that, but we'll do our best probably sometime before the holiday break. Uh, you'll be able to see that information, but the slides themselves should be available on our website much sooner than that. Um, I'll just reiterate again. We are not changing the structure of the program for next year. So your children who are in the program, or if you have children who would like to be in the program or you want that for them, we're not changing the two-teacher model for next year. None of the structure is going to be adjusted for the 23-24 school year. It will remain the same as it currently is. doesn't mean that we may not adjust or tweak some things within the program instructionally based upon some of the challenges that you've seen tonight. But for those of you who have children in the program or you would hope that your children will be in the program, the program will continue as is for next year. So what we're going to now take the next six to 12 months to do is based on the feedback, based upon the conversation with the community, we're going to convene a task force of some kind. We don't yet know what that will look like to study this, probably throughout this coming spring, the summer, and into next fall before we make any determination. So we're not reverting back to the recommendation that you heard in October. We're going to go forward based upon uh, actually with an open mind to see what new ideas may emerge from the community that we can use to respond to the challenges that you've seen outlined this evening to determine what adjustments, if any, are made to the program going forward. So I do want to ask some of the questions that have been submitted this evening, and again, we won't be able to get to all of these, but I want to try to get through as many of them as we can with respect to time so that you can still get home to your families here at a reasonable hour. So here's the first question. Would it be possible to fund additional resources to implement components of the Spanish Immersion Program for more students, hence using money to ensure that the Spanish Immersion Program remains unchanged? Anybody at the panel want to take that or? Sure. Would it be possible to fund additional resources to implement components of the Spanish Immersion Program for more students? Hence, using money to ensure that the Spanish Immersion Program remains unchanged. I'll take that. Or Molly, would you like to start? Okay. For the program to remain unchanged while still trying to address some of the issues that we've outlined, particularly in our traditional or general ed sections, it would essentially mean adding a teacher. Many people have said they understand the rationale for a self-contained model, for example. But to do that, you'd have to have two bilingual teachers in each grade level, and that would actually mean adding an additional section for each grade level in that case. Well, that's based upon a number of assumptions. One, can we find the additional bilingual teachers to do that? And two, do all of our campuses even have the room to add an additional classroom or section in those grade levels? Cedar Creek, for example, is completely maxed out, has no more additional classrooms even for us to consider that possibility. So it's not just a financial consideration, finding the additional bilingual teacher, funding an additional what we would call an FTE or a full-time equivalent teacher for that grade level or all grade levels, but then it also becomes a space consideration as well because we simply don't have the space in all of our classrooms or all of our campuses to do that. Next question, why have members of the board and administration said that they don't value diversity, equity, and inclusion, or consider the SI program to be consistent with DEI ideals. Anybody on the panel want to take that one? I, what you think you just heard from the panel is I don't think anyone has said that or anyone believes that on the panel. We do believe that the program, um, we've, we've highlighted the fact that the program 
brings about some um, you know, cultural awareness, not only for the students in the SI program, but there's been a lot of activities that go campus wide. And so no one does not think that this program adds to the goal around diversity. Um, and we support keeping the Spanish immersion program. We are just looking at how to make some changes to the program, but we support it as part of the initiative around DEI. All right, next question that is also within the theme of the structure of the program. And uh, this, I think, gets to some of the research that has been done. Time constraints seem to be a consistent problem. How have similar school districts, like Alamo Heights, been able to navigate these challenges without cutting their program while continuing their program? I want to talk about other districts that we've looked at or what we have learned from some of those other school districts. Um, I think I mentioned this a little bit um, when I spoke. Most other school districts have a 90-10 model, and most of the um, bilingual-type programs in Texas are for um, English speakers to, or sorry, Spanish speakers to acquire English. So a lot of our, almost all of our teachers are coming from a dual language program or a bilingual program, which actually is not consistent with what we are doing. So we are trying, we still are in this pilot phase like we talked about. Our fifth graders are the first pilot. We have not had a year yet where we haven't had to add a grade. And so, um, you know, we, we are still navigating and we are trying to still um, figure it out. And I think that we are unique in that we are trying to do it at four different schools while maintaining the exact number of students that we need, which I think is, has presented a challenge. There's also several in Kamal ISD that we plan to look at as well, and um, not far from here. And then I, we actually have a teacher who, Jordan, who is Jordan? Jordan is a product of Alamo Heights Spanish Immersion Program as well. <laughs> Shout out. And it is a 90-10. And it starts in first grade. Thank you, Leslie Ryan. Yeah. So here are a couple of questions related to middle school. Um, and I'll just group these two together because I think they, they could be answered similarly. What are the current options you're considering for sixth grade at Hill Country Middle School, and have you considered a zero hour for Spanish students in sixth grade if a core subject cannot be taught in Spanish? And will middle school 2A and 2B include some cultural aspects as well as Spanish? So 2A and 2B will absolutely um, provide some cultural you know, opportunities and activities for those students. As we mentioned, as Chad mentioned, these students are coming in as unique to us in Eanes ISD in this 2A and 2B while still covering the TEKS because they have to receive the TEKS in order to earn their Spanish 1 or Spanish 2 credit. Um, they will have opportunities to, will have an opportunity to take some of that curriculum and do some things differently with it than you would a traditional student who went from Spanish 1, you know, say as a ninth grader to Spanish 2 as a 10th grader. So that Spanish 2A and 2B is going to look very different. And I will say at this point, um, we are not considering a zero hour giving, given our, our teachers and our, our staffing and um, the middle, middle school structure, so that's not something we're considering right now. Okay. As a district of innovation, do we have the ability to add instructional minutes to the day for the Spanish Immersion Program? Could the day begin or end earlier one day per week to allow for the missed minutes to be regained? Um, that would not, 
need necessarily need to happen um, even through the District of Innovation and we could lengthen the school day for all our students if we chose to do that as a school district. Um, but there are a lot of implications for that when you think about the teachers and um, their, their day, their work day and asking them transportation, yeah. but teachers and transportation and athletics and you know other, other considerations for our students. Have you looked at student performance on testing at the campuses that do not have Spanish immersion? How does that student performance at each of those two campuses compare to those campuses that do? Uh, yeah, we, we have. It's very similar. Um, same trends that we saw as far as growth um, and when you compare your traditional sides. So they matched up with the traditional growth trajectories that you saw um, when, those, when those two cohorts or those two campuses were added in to that NWA MAPS data. Um, the, student, or the Spanish immersion student population appears to test above the normal population. While there might be minimal declines in the growth rates at the fourth and fifth level, the two populations appear to have negligible differences. What metrics are the district using to determine the SI test scores indicate a problem? Let me see if I can find it again. It's basically just asking what metrics are you using to determine that the negligible differences between Spanish immersion growth and those that of the traditional students is a concern. Yeah, so right currently right now with the, the MAPS data that was presented, it's not necessarily we're looking at that as an SI program as the causation of those, those growth declines. What that does is that gives us a point to start going in and collecting more data to see if there is an actual issue that needs to be addressed within, it within the a, either the Spanish Immersion Program or the traditional side. So what we're hoping to see when those two metrics are compared, a traditional cohort versus an SI cohort, is a trajectory of growth that matches. When they don't match, there's something off a little bit. Um, and, and I appreciate whoever wrote this of like, it's yes, the, we're talking points here and there. Um, statistically, um, not a big significant difference within that, but as a district that we are trying to move forward the needle inch by inch, percentage point by percentage point, every student matters. Um, and, and so those cases where we start to see either decline growth, we start looking and trying to determine why that decline growth happened. Sometimes it's reasons as in COVID, um, as was mentioned in some of the questions, sometimes it's reasons as in instructional time is being lost. Um, instructional time could also just be lost because a teacher was sick for a week um, and then that class has fallen a week behind. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you throw everything out when that trajectory starts to lag. Um, it just gives us an opportunity to go in, evaluate what's happening, look at other data points, classroom data. Um, at the elementary level, a lot of anecdotal data is used. Um, a lot of our students repeat things over, so we don't have a lot of hard data like you would at the high school with, like here's an assessment grade. Um, they get to redo those assessments, so they get to relook at them, re-engage with that content. So we're looking at that growth. It's not necessarily what you make on that moment, but what do you make on the next attempt? How do you move that forward? Um, so with that data that was presented, it's not necessarily that's the red flag. Everything is going awry. We need to course correct. That's just an opportunity to start looking at why do those two trajectories not match? What's going on in one cohort versus another cohort? Um, and determining how can we best support teachers within one cohort that may be lagging versus the other. All right. I'm going to pose this one to any one of the principals if they would take it. Um, um, would it be possible to consider changing to one full day in Spanish, alternating with a full day in English ongoing, thereby avoiding the transition time challenges? I will take it because I have a teacher that tried it. Um, so our teachers are fabulous and our problem solvers, and as they've brought forth these challenges, they've tried a lot of things. So we've tried A days, B days, where you're with the same teacher all day, and then the next day you have the other teacher. We've tried A week, B week, where you don't transition at all that week. Um, and so you're staying with your Spanish teacher. You get a full week of Spanish, and then the next week you get a full week of English. So we've worked through many of these things. None of it's perfect. Um, none of it has stuck to the point where the teachers felt like, yes, this was successful. I'm going to keep doing this. 
Um, we've all given them the freedom as professionals to experiment with what works because they know their students and their needs. And so we're certainly open to all of those options. And I think that's what the next six to 12 months is gonna look like is exploring all of that. Um, but they have tried it. There's of course then other challenges. So um, if you take a child who is, I love math, math is my thing. The day that I'm in math all day, I love life, it's great. The next day when I have to do language arts all day and I struggle with writing, um, maybe that's an area where you see some behaviors from me because I don't like to do it, so I push back on writing time or I maybe mentally don't have as much confidence in myself. That's a whole day of that or it's a whole week of that. Um, so it takes out some of that balance in a child's day and knowing that they have strengths, they have growth areas, they all do. Um, or if Spanish, the language, can be a particular challenge, especially in kindergarten, right? I mean, you're hearing your whole day in a language that you don't understand yet. That's hard. Um, so we try it all. We're open to trying the things, but there are definitely still challenges within that model that we've seen happen. Okay. Any other principals want to add to that? Anything else you'd like to say? I was just going to say that to piggyback off Laura, I, I did see some questions in here about expanding the program and I think that that's kind of where we feel like we need to figure some things out before we add to the program. Um, Sherry, while you have the microphone, go ahead, Leslie. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I can hand it back. No, I do like okay. a microphone. But, um, <laughs> so <laughs> one of the things that I think, um, you know, because we've tried a lot of different things, I think it's something that we're open to. We want to be creative in making this work for our students. Um, but we also are held to some expectations around instructional minutes within content areas. Um, specifically, if we're wanting to maintain balance with students who receive services in special education or within an IEP plan, it's pretty critical that um, we adhere to a schedule of services that's federally mandated. And so there, there are some legal implications. You know, I think we've um, been able to manipulate the minutes, especially when it says, you know, this number of minutes within over the course of nine weeks, that gives you some leeway. But when you have a schedule of services for a student that specifies 90 minutes within the instructional day on a daily basis, it limits you a bit in what you, um, in, in how creative you can get because you are required, especially if a student receives collaborative or modified um, services. And if we're wanting to maintain that balance of equity within our instructional settings, um, it's going to be critical that we're able to deliver that instruction to adhere to that federal mandate. Okay. Um, Sherry, there were a number of questions uh, related to fourth grade at Bridgepoint. It's well known that this year we had a, a very small number of students who returned to the program in fourth grade at Bridgepoint, and that provided an opportunity to collapse the program into one self-contained classroom. Can you talk a little bit about what you've observed or learned as a result of that? Yes, so I won't point her out, but I think she's here. Um, so she, um, my fourth grade teacher, Miss Flanders, was very instrumental in coming up with the solution. Um, we talked when we could kind of see the writing on the wall as far as numbers go. We were down to 27 students, I believe. And um, my other fourth grade classes were full at 22. And so um, we chatted, and I said, I, I assume she would want to do math and science in Spanish and then have another math and science block in English. To me, that made perfect sense. But to her, she said, well, actually, that's still for planning preps. That's still for preps. I can't just take what I did in Spanish and transfer it to English, and that would be double the kids. And so I would prefer to do, if I have to do four contents anyway, I'd rather do self-contained and keep my students. That will give me the flexibility to go a, bit, a little bit longer in math if I need to one day and then make up for science the next day. Um, I know that there's been lots of questions too about keeping a cohort of kids together for that long. And I don't disagree with you. That Anytime you solve a problem, you generally create another one. And so that's kind of what we and you are tasked with, is we want you to recognize that we have these really big challenges. And you may not 
agree with our solution and we're committed to figuring it out, but that was one of the solutions so that we could fix the time issue, so we could fix the instructional minutes issue, um, but it, it does present a whole new set of challenges. I do think um, it's going well, um, but yes, the same 22 kids are together in fourth grade and this is year five of them being together. So, you know, there are some things from a social emotional standpoint that we have had to really pour into and, and work out with them. All right, similar to that, and perhaps principals can answer this one as well, what support do teachers need to relieve the issues they're experiencing in the current format? How are resources and best practices being shared? All right, good, I get the mic back. Okay, so there are a lot of things that we've done. I think uh, we're fortunate that we embed time for professional collaboration within our professional learning communities. And so there are opportunities for our teachers who are um, on the Spanish side specifically who are able to collaborate with their grade level peers, um, taking them from feeling like an island to that they have this learning community where they can share ideas, share celebration, share this lesson was not great. Does anyone have anything that they could contribute that I could apply in my class tomorrow? Um, I think that continued professional learning um, is something that we all value, not only at our four campuses, but all of our campuses. Um, it's why it's a part of our instructional day as well, that they collaborate not only with SI teachers, but also with their entire grade level. Um, I think that if I'm really thinking through what a teacher's want, I think Renee Brown says it best, clear is kind. You know, I think having a very clear idea of, of what this should look like, how we navigate this, when they have a plan, they feel equipped to be successful. And I think to some of the points that were raised earlier, as we switch things around and we adjust things, and there's a part of that just in education in general, <laughs> you have to be flexible. Um, and our teachers, are beautifully flexible in how they implement what they do on a daily basis. But when you're looking at overhauling a program mid-quarter and changing your entire daily schedule, it's significant. And so I think really equipping them with those research tools that you know we're gonna come together as a committee and you know streamline to find something that works best for Ian's ISD and they have a plan that they feel confident in and that we feel confident in and that addresses all of these concerns, which would be magical. Um, hopefully we can get there. Uh, that clarity, I think, is what they need. Um, I think instructional time, they'll make a, with it what they have. Um, they do so beautifully. But to really do it well, I think making our plan as great as possible to serve students is what they want with a clear plan moving forward. I'm gonna jump back to a question about middle school. With the addition of immersion Spanish 2A to the sixth grade curriculum, how does that adjust the current sixth grade schedule, the fine arts, and the wheel? What will be adjusted to add this Spanish immersion course for Spanish immersion students progressing to middle school? So in sixth grade, students have three electives. They have um, PE, they have a music elective, and they have what's called the wheel. And the wheel is made up of um, drama, art and then a technology and those those are like 12 week um, I think 12 week uh, rotations so for a student who wants to take Spanish as a sixth grader they will be looking at um, which of those electives either the music elective or the wheel that they um, would not take as a sixth grader and just to point out that um, we have a lot of sixth graders that have to make choices about their electives. Um, if they're going to be in an additional reading class or they're gonna take a study skills class. So it's not uncommon for a sixth grader to have to choose um, to take a different elective um, than one that is offered at the middle school um, for a lot of the other students. Okay. Number of questions inferring or excuse me, implying that COVID probably has had some impact on the data that's being reviewed. Do you believe some of the challenges highlighted on student performance data could be from COVID-related impact over the past two to three years? Absolutely, um, but our traditional kids also experienced COVID 
And so it was challenging for them as well. There was challenges for every student um, across our nation. And so when you look at those scores, those nationally normed scores are also impacted by COVID, right? It wasn't a specific to Eden's problem. And in fact, we were very fortunate compared to many um, to be able to start you know, remote learning right away. So um, yes, of course, that's absolutely a factor. And yes, that has absolutely contributed to challenges. But when you're looking at that comparison data, that same, it's been a factor for all data sets. And I would like to point out that, you know, we do believe that, that the decrease in our science scores is, that COVID was an impact on that. Because if you talk to the teachers during COVID, one of the things that they let go of was science. And so that is why we are concerned when we have teachers who are telling us that they are, they don't have enough time to teach Spanish since we, I mean, science, since we saw the issues, we believe that not teaching as much science during COVID did contribute to those decrease in our star science scores when you have teachers who are still unable to provide as much science instruction as they would like and they think is necessary that is why we were concerned we do understand because i know there's been confusion we understand that no one in fifth grade has taken the science star test yet we do understand that that was not what was said at the meeting in october but it definitely was confusing when you're talking about those students but that's why we're concerned about the amount of science science instruction is we don't want to continue to perpetuate that issue when we're just not having enough, enough time to get our science instruction in. Molly, while you have the microphone, I have a question for you related to special ed. Could special, or excuse me, Spanish immersion map scores be indicative of the need for special ed resources on the Spanish immersion side? Can you just talk about special ed in the Spanish immersion uh, environment in general? Sure, so as we've mentioned, your Spanish in immersion is an open enrollment program. So starting in K-1, anyone who's interested, obviously you have to test into the higher grades. So any student is eligible to come into Spanish immersion. And so we do support our special education students to the best of our ability within the Spanish immersion program. There have been some comments, I know through emails, that you know, special education students are forced out of Spanish immersion. Um, as most of you who have any knowledge of special education know, you have an ARD committee that's made up of parents and educators. And so none of these principals are um, forcing anyone out of Spanish immersion. That would be an ARD committee decision, as Leslie described. Um, but there are a lot of special education students for whom Spanish immersion is not the best place for them. Um, there is a cognitive load when you're learning two languages. I know there's a lot of research about, you know, that students with disabilities can excel in a Spanish immersion program, and I do not doubt that research, research. But I also understand that students with certain disabilities, it really is hard for them to be learning two languages at the same time. And so we support our special education students as best as we can in Spanish immersion, but as it is, it is important to note that both our students that are our emergent bilingual students and our students in special education, they are served through mandated federal programs. And so we have to make sure that those students are getting the supports they need in the best environment possible with the structures and the resources we have within EANS ISD. Spanish immersion is an enrichment program. It's not a, it's not a requirement. And so when we have a student who we see is needing certain supports or structures and the Spanish immersion program isn't meeting their needs, we do have those conversations with parents. And it is a collective decision on having those students move, move out. But all students are eligible to participate in the Spanish immersion program. And again, as Leslie alluded to earlier, you know, sometimes you have a student who, or I've heard from some of you, you know, you guys have two or three year olds who you want in the Spanish immersion program. And that's amazing and that's exciting. But sometimes you may realize when they get to be in kindergarten that maybe it's not the best you know, place for them. I think there are some families, I know of families, who one of their students is in Spanish immersion and another's not, because it's not the right fit, even though they love Spanish immersion for their particular student. So it really is an individual student, an individual decision for each student, um, and, and not even necessarily a family decision that all your kids would be in Spanish immersion. But our special education students, you know, definitely we see in the data, the inequities, it is, 
it does end up with a lot of those students being in those traditional sections, um, and we're trying to figure out how to balance and support them as best we can. But when possible and when it works, we definitely want all of our students who want to be in Spanish immersion to be successful in that program. Um, in the presentation, it was noted that uh, we've had an attrition rate or a turnover rate of roughly 64% of our Spanish immersion teachers. Um, the question is asked, what was the rate for traditional or non-Spanish immersion teachers? I believe it's about 15% roughly. When so you look from year to year, we look, yeah, lose about 15% of our teachers year to year. So it's about four times greater in Spanish immersion. Um, other question was asked regarding teacher aides. Why wouldn't we just hire more teacher aides to support the teachers in the program? Um, because we, we certainly understand the challenges and the pressures they face. Um, so two things to speak to that. One is, you know, we do um, work within a budget, and so just adding additional staff, um, you know, that, that adds to our overall budget. And so we have to be, con you know, conscientious about our spending and be fiscally responsible about how much staff we are adding. Um, another concern is just finding teaching assistance. Um, in the special education program right now, um, again, a federally mandated program, so we're, you know, we have to provide services to students. We are not fully staffed this year. There is not a district in probably the country that is fully staffed with special education teaching assistants. And so we are, we are looking for those people. We, um, you know, are out recruiting as best as we can, but there is a shortage of those teaching assistants. Um, we also get a lot of questions about you need to be or ask to hire bilingual teaching assistants, and that is very difficult. I mean, not only can we not find just a teaching assistant, finding someone who's bilingual to come in and, as a teaching assistant is also very difficult. So there's two, there's two, you know, caveats to that. There is, you know, the financial consideration of just adding more and more staff, and then there also is just, um, just recruitment and being able to fill those positions. I do want to mention one thing I did about the, uh, the attrition. The attrition for the Spanish immersion, that is the bilingual teacher over that six-year period. So I do just want to make that clear, that over that six-year period, we have a 64% attrition rate. So the apples to apples is about 15% a year for the for the traditional. We'll get into that bow when we look at the when the committee does its work. So okay. 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 I think the bottom line is that we are experiencing a significant number of Spanish-speaking teachers leave us for various reasons, so we are having to hire them. I feel, personally, I can only speak for BCE at a more significant rate than I am my traditional classroom teachers. Okay, let's move on. As I said, there are a lot of questions that we're not going to be able to specifically address in tonight's meeting. So. Um, other questions related to why we don't look at hiring teachers from outside the country or look at some sort of a visiting teacher program, visa, teach, uh, visa programs for teachers. Uh, anybody want to comment on that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. It, I think it's about a $7,000 cost for the district to sponsor someone coming with a visa. It's a cost issue. And um, there are certain positions that through District of Innovation we have flexibility on certifications for. Bilingual teachers is not one of them. So they have to hold that bilingual certification in that position. So um, sometimes we frequently get people reaching out about positions. And so you may have someone reaching out from another country that's bilingual but is not a certified teacher in the United States. So they're not eligible for the role. All right, we do want to be respectful of your time. We're going to end the meeting by 8 o'clock, but there was one other question that was asked that I want to try to address, and it's specific to the deliverables or what are the next steps. As Molly indicated, we are going to work together with the community to look at this. Uh, we're not making any changes for next year that would affect accessibility to the program. But over the course of the next 6 to 12 months, 
with the objective of making a decision by this time next year as to whether or not we would need to adjust the model. We're going to seek the input of the community and also provide opportunity for probably for the third time in the last six years, a task force to be convened specific to Spanish immersion. We don't yet know what that will look like. In all likelihood, we're going to enlist the help of an outside facilitator, but we're still looking for what might be the right um, partner in that process. We'll probably be making some uh, announcements sometime after the beginning of the school year as to what those opportunities might be for those of you who want to continue to be a part of the process going forward. But we've not made any of those determinations, just like we've not determined to make any changes to the program for the upcoming school year. I know that there's a lot of information that has been shared with you tonight, uh, information that we're comfortable with because we look at it on a daily basis, but when you're hearing it for the first time, it's probably, or appears to be, sounds to be perhaps incomplete, maybe even frustrating, but I can assure you, uh, this group and many other staff diligently look at these challenges, they look at this data on a regular basis. And we hope that you'll be a partner with us in the process going forward as we determine what Spanish immersion will look like in the future, as well as what we can do to leverage this opportunity to improve our programs for all students not just those in Spanish immersion, but for those who are in the traditional or the general ed sections as well, so that we can maintain the standard that you expect of an EANS education for every child entrusted to our care. So we will be getting back with you. We'll share more information with you. I appreciate your patience tonight because a lot of information has been shared with you this evening. We know that there are a lot of questions that have been left unanswered, perhaps even more questions that have been raised, but that's now the opportunity that we'll have over the next several months to consider those questions alongside the data and making a community decision as to what the program looks like going forward. So it's just about 8 o'clock. I want to thank you for being here this evening. Uh, we want to give you time to get back to your families, and hopefully you all have a nice holiday season ahead. So again, thank you very much.